As Daniel said, we're, we're going in, uh, continuing in our series in Nehemiah. He introduced us to us to us last week. He talked about in his message, he talked about how to begin the good work. And I, and I think that's just so important to, to get into our minds today. How do we begin that good work? We've got to begin with God. We've got to begin with him. We get this desire in our heart. We all have something that's passionate in our heart. We get this burning inside of us that we just, we just can't ignore. It just wells up inside of us and it, it, occupy, it occupies our day. Sometimes it keep us, keeps us awake at night. But we have this burning desire and we just can't ignore it and we know that we need to act. We need to act upon it. And last week, Daniel told us that he talked about when Nehemiah got some bad news. Nehemiah's life was going great. He had no worries. He was in the king's palace. He, he had the best food. He had the best clothes. He was serving the king. He was in the top position. Life was good. And he had some visitors come, and he was excited, and he was looking forward to them. And he comes home, and he says, hey, tell me how's it going back home. How are things going on back there? And then he was hit with a bombshell told him things were horrible, told him that Jerusalem was a wreck, it was in shambles, the people were being disgraced. And Daniel was so moved, or Daniel, Daniel was moved by it too, I saw him last week. Nehemiah was so moved by that news that the first thing he did was he sat down and he mourned and he cried. And I know many people have been doing that this week, they've been sitting down and they've been mourning, they've been crying. And I think the point to see there is that before we can do anything, we have to deal with the emotional part of it. We have to work it through our heart. Then Daniel said we need to kneel and pray, just like Nehemiah did. He mourned, then he knelt, he fasted, and he prayed. You know, prayer invokes the God of heaven. A little bit of math for you. God plus one always equals the majority. Always equals the majority. Then after kneeling and praying, Nehemiah got up and he started to make a plan. Daniel said, we need to stand and we need to act. Somebody's got to do something. And Nehemiah said, it might as well be me. I might as well be the one. So the sermon for today I titled, Just Do It, but do it right. Do it right. Nehemiah is a great study of leadership. It's one of my favorite books in the, in the Old Testament, and I've done several studies on it. And, and, and most of them that you see are about leadership. Nehemiah is a great example of leadership in the Bible. But he's also a good study and a great study on the obedience to God's call and trusting in God. Trusting in God. Now, last time we saw Nehemiah, like I said earlier, he'd just gotten some bad news. He'd been told that Jerusalem was in the shambles, and it really drove into his heart. It was important to him. The people in Jerusalem were being disgraced. And he was burdened and he cried. And then he got busy. He prayed. We need to deal with our emotional feelings before we decide to act. I don't know if you were like me. There's been times in my life when, when something happened that meant a lot to me and it just really burned in my heart. And I'd go running off just based on the emotions, usually didn't turn out very well. Usually didn't turn out very well. We need to sit down. We need to, we need to feel that emotion. We need to release that emotion. So then we can start thinking clearly. We can start seeking God's wisdom on what it is that we need to do. Acting out on emotions is usually not a good thing. We make some rash decisions under those conditions. 
So Nehemiah sits down and he cries and he seeks out God and, and he prays to him and, and he confesses and he says, God, please show me favor. Show me favor in this. And I think in these first few verses, we see that going to God should always be our first response, should always be our first action, is take it to God. Nehemiah's prayer and reaching out to God is a model for all of us to use, for all of us to follow. So today, I, I, I hope that as we go through this, that we're going to see how his prayer was answered. We're going to see how God begins to show him favor and, and begins to use him. And not only Nehemiah, but he begins to move other people to come alongside of Nehemiah. You know, when a burden starts burning in our heart, when we, when we have that unsatiable feeling that we need to do something, we need to follow Nehemiah's lead. We need to do like Nehemiah did. And the first thing we need to do is seek God faithfully. Seek God faithfully. As we return into our book of Nehemiah in the second chapter, we've kind of moved about four months down the road from when he initially received the the bad news, and he's been praying, and he's been fasting, and we return to him, and he's in the month of Kislev, which is about four months after he got the news, and he's been praying and fasting for four months. And i got to be honest with you. There's times that I've been praying to God about something, and I've gotten bored, fed up in five minutes. You know, we live in this instantaneous gratitude society and we want things now. We want it in our time. We want it in our way. We want it to happen when we want it to happen. And God says, but it's in my timing. He prayed and fasted for four months. Crying out to God in chapter one, I think we see what's what I call a strategic prayer. He comes before God and he opens his heart to God and he says, I'm struggling. And God, I confess to you that, that we've sinned, that we've turned away from your ways, that we haven't been the people that you have called us to be. And then he reminds God of his promise to the children of Israel. And then he asks God for favor. Grant me favor, Lord, in this. Let's turn into our Bibles into Nehemiah. And in chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 1. So after he's prayed and he's fasted and, and he's gone to God and he's talked to God about it, we see here that in verse 1 it says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can, own, this can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid. I was very much afraid. The wine was brought to the king. It doesn't say what the occasion is. Maybe it was a banquet. Maybe it was just his normal evening procedure that he would sit down after dinner and have a glass of wine and Nehemiah would bring it to him. It doesn't tell us what the occasion is, but Nehemiah says, I was afraid. When the king asked me, why are you sad? I'm, I was afraid. And you need to understand what's going on at the time here. Why was Nehemiah so afraid? And he was afraid because at the time it was a capital offense to be sad in front of the king. You didn't bring your bad news to the king, and you certainly didn't bring up your personal problems. It'd be like going to work and just having a really bad day and, and messing up a lot because you can't concentrate and the boss fires you. Only this would be a whole lot worse. 
Because it would have meant you're either going to prison or you're going to lose your life just for being sad in front of the king. So Nehemiah had allowed his emotions to show in front of the king. And so when he said, he said, why do you look so sad and, and what's going on? Again, he immediately his heart just kind of sank. Servants weren't allowed to bring their issues to work. You were serving the king, you were in the king's presence and you needed to keep that in mind. But then the king opens the door for Nehemiah. And Nehemiah walks right in. In verse 2, or verse 3, he says, But I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why shouldn't my face look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? This was a rhetorical question. I don't think he actually expected the king to respond with an answer for him on that. but it was an opening for a conversation. Why shouldn't I be sad? These are the conditions of my homeland. As the response shows concern, shows that he had a deep burden for the situation back in Jerusalem. But he didn't expound upon that. He didn't go on to explain what God had put on his heart and what his plans were. And I think this was probably kind of a calculated response. I think he wanted to fill out where the king was a little bit before he dove in feet first. But it opened up the opportunity for the king to ask him a question. It's kind of, kind of like a cliffhanger when you're reading a, a book or, or when you're watching a series or, or a movie and they give, give you just enough at the end there to say, okay, come back next week. And I'll give you a little more. So the king was curious. He wanted more information. So in verse 4, he says, the king said to me, what is it you want? And Nehemiah says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. I prayed to the God of heaven. Now this is a, it's a little bit different prayer than what we read about in chapter 1. In chapter 1, it was a, a strategic prayer where it was heartfelt and he went to God, and he says, I know things are bad, and God, I know that I, I confess my sins, and, and I confess the sins of our nation, and I come before you in a humble heart, and I ask you for your favor upon the people and upon me. But this is one of those spontaneous things. It's kind of like when you're getting ready to go in for a job interview, and the door opens, and the secretary says, the boss is ready to talk to you. Come on in, and you just get this, <clears throat> you say, okay, God, <laughs> you and me, right? Here we go. Trust in you, God. Bring it on. So Nehemiah prayed to the God in heaven. And I think it's a perfect example in God's word of spontaneous prayer. Prayer can happen anywhere at any time. Amen? Amen. Amen. So after praying and fasting for four months, he's given a chance to express his burden, the call that he feels on his heart. And the point that I want to express to here is if you want folks to come alongside you on whatever is, is, is a burden on your heart, on whatever it is that you're wanting to do, you have to be able to explain things clearly. You have to be able to define the vision clearly. You can't go in with this muddled idea about, well, you know, gosh, I, I, I was kind of thinking maybe probably... You know, you have to come forward. You have to have a plan. You have to know what it is you want to do. And Nehemiah, he didn't spend, I don't believe he spent the last four months just fasting and praying and saying, God, send somebody to do something over there so I can feel better about it. This is burning on my heart, so I need you to send somebody over there to fix it and make it right. And by this time, when he came before the king and the king asked him what was going on, he had a plan. He spent the last four months praying to God and fasting and saying, okay, God, how are we going to do this? How am I going to contribute to this? And he answers the king. He said, I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried. 
so that I can rebuild it. He didn't just say, just send me over there so I can take a vacation. He didn't say, just send me over there so I can see what's happening on, sit back with my bros, check it all out. He had a plan. Send me back there so I can rebuild the city. When you ask God, when you pray to God, pray specifically. God knows what you want. He knows what the situation is. But we need to come to him and say, God, this is what's on my heart. God, this is what I feel I need to do. When you ask others to come alongside and help, you need to ask specifically what you need. He'd been praying and planning specifically, so when the right moment came, he asked specifically. Now he's got the king's attention. He knows it. He sees that God is, is showing him favor, and, and the king is conducive to what he's trying to do there. And, and he says, then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And will you, when will you come back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. And we're not told how long Nehemiah told him he was going to be gone. We find out later, probably about 12 years around there. But then he decides, okay, I've gone this far, God. I'm going in all the way up to here. I'm diving in, God. Need your help. Please continue to show favor through the king. And he says in verse 7, he says, I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so they will provide me with safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. Oh, and may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal part, so he'll give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. Oh, and, and because of the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my requests. Yes. God had shown favor of Nehemiah's request. He had a plan and he knew he couldn't just pack up his overnight bag and run out of the castle and jump on the next bus to Jerusalem. He had to have a plan in place. He had to know what was going on and he had to be able to express that clearly. It's important to make a plan, to make sure you know you have what you need to do what it is you want to do. So when you've prayed and you fasted and you, you know what God has you for to do, you need to make plans carefully. Nehemiah knew that this journey would be through some political regions in the area. He knew that there would be some opposition to what he was planning to do. There were people there who didn't want to see this city rebuilt. They didn't want to see the Jewish people revive. He knew that if he were stopped, he would need proof to show that he was supposed to be where he was at. Asked for letters for the materials he would need. Can't do the job without the supplies. He asked for beams for the gates and for support and framing for the wall and to build a temporary residence. And as he was explaining all this to the king, I think Nehemiah displays one of the greatest biblical concepts here. And we see it in Proverbs 29, verse 18. It says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. Where there's no vision, People would become distracted. But there's no vision. There's no incentive for people to come alongside and, and help you accomplish that. And I stole this one from Daniel. It says, if you can't define it, you can't do it. If you don't have clear vision, how can others follow you? You have to know where you're going. You know, when I study the Bible, no matter what book or scripture I'm in, I always, I always have to ask, why? 
Daisy always taught our gir gir uh, girls the five, what is the, the who, what, where, when, how, and why. Why was always the last question. Why? Why? Why did the king ask Nehemiah about him being so sad? Why did the king consent for his number one guy to go on a journey off to another country for who knows how long? Why would he consent to give him letters of passage and provide him with all of the materials and stuff that he would need to accomplish what it is he wanted to do? And I'll tell you why. Because God showed him favor. God responded to his prayer. My question for you today is when you pray, are you believing God will answer? When you're asking God, do you believe that he will provide? James chapter 1 verse 6 says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed about by the wind. When we ask God for his favor, are we asking in belief that he is going to provide, that he is going to answer? You know, I uh, read a story about a woman who's about, uh, you know, in her mid-80s. And every morning she would come out on her front porch and she'd raise her hands up and she'd say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your provision in my life. Thank you, God, for being the creator of the universe and for loving me. And she had a neighbor who lived next door there who was, let's just say, he wasn't a believer. And every morning when she'd come out, she'd praise God. He'd come out on his porch and he'd say, stop saying that. There is no God. You're a fool. And one morning she came out and she said, thank you, God, for who you are and for your provision. And, and Lord, I'm kind of struggling right now and I could, I could really use some groceries. And the next morning she got up and she walked back out on her porch and there were some groceries on her front porch. And she walks up to the porch and she says, thank you, God. Thank you for providing. And her neighbor jumped out from behind a bush and he said, ha, there is no God. He didn't give you those groceries. I bought them. I did it. And she jumps back up and she says, thank you, God, for your provision. And you made the devil pay for it. <laughs> That's believing. God will provide. And he'll move on the hearts of people that you would not believe. When we are faithful, when we pray, when we believe, when we trust, then Nehemiah sets off on his journey. We pick up in verse 11. He says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal, the well, and the dung gate. Excuse me. I'm getting fired up here. My mouth is drying out. And the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. And finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Nehemiah arrives in Jerusalem and he, he tells us that he spent three days before he took any action. Why? I mean, you're on fire for this, for this mission and, and you're going and, and you get there and you, you kick back and take a three-day break. You have to understand a little bit about this. We're not told how long his journey took. 
But if you think about it, it's nearly 1,000 miles from Susa to Jerusalem. It'd be like going from here to Kansas City, Kansas on horseback. On horseback. I think if I rode a horse for two hours, let alone 40 days, I would need some break too. A little recovery time. But the trip would take about a month. About a month. And he starts out with an inspection and trying to figure out exactly what needs to be done. He wanted a clearer vision of just what was there. He knew what God had sent him to do, and now he needed to complete that plan on how are we going to do it. What are the circumstances? And there were several people that went with him, and they they were on foot, and he was on horseback. This would have been an all-night outing. Jerusalem at the time was about 48 square miles. That's a lot of area to cover. Not to mention trying to wake your way through rubble and all kinds of stuff that's in your way and you have to get off the horse and walk through narrow paths and everything. It took a while to circle that city to see what was going on. And he finally came to a decision. He says, this place, this place is a disaster. This place is a disgrace. So finally he meets with the people. And he shares with the group what God has put on his heart and what's ahead for them. And the scripture says, then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told him about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work to get folks excited about what you're excited about. You need to inspire people. You need to inspire them by your passion. So stay with me here just a little bit longer. Close it out here shortly. And we don't know what the entire makeup of the audience was that he was talking to. We know that he said there were officials, there were priests, there were nobles, but there were commoners. Maybe it was a combination of all of them when he spoke to them. But there were people of influence in this group. And Nehemiah knew that if you want to get something done, You've got to have people that are movers. You've got to have people that are influencers. And he wasn't just making an obvious assessment about what was there, but he was making a plan. He was finishing out the plan, and he says, come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be a disgrace. Nehemiah appeals to their heritage. He, he appeals to what has been burdening their hearts. We're a disgrace. We're, we're shaming our God here, and we need to fix it. Our lineage, our ancestry, and our ancestors who put this here are disgraced, and it's up to us to change. And they bought in, and they caught the passion, and they caught the vision that Nehemiah had. You know, I've always heard common phrase that no one can do everything but everyone can do something God has a calling and a purpose for each and every one of us what's yours what are you passionate about Daniel talked about this last week and Jacqueline talked about this last week, about seeing so much stuff on the internet, on social media, and people talking. And I've seen a lot of passionate posts about about things that, that bother them. I've seen them post that they're they're disgusted and they're 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 upset and they're worried about 
human trafficking and, and, and abortion and, and social injustice. And some of these people I know, some of them I don't. And what I say to you, if you're posting this, if you're passionate about this, I say, good for you. Good for you that God has put this passion into your heart, that you're feeling burdened about these things, but have you prayed about it? Have you taken it to God? And if you have, what's your plan? What are you going to do about it? I think of that song by uh, Matthew West. You know, when I was shaking my fist at God saying, you see all this going on here, God, why don't you do something? And he says, I did. I created you. I created you. We have a corporate purpose in this world as a church. We're called to be the light. We're called to spread the gospel. We're called to build the kingdom, but each and every one of us is called to do it in different ways. Not all are prophets, not all are teachers, not all pray in tongues. We all are part of this body. We all have our own individual jobs to do. It's the prayer of my heart this year. And my prayer is that Lord, Give us favor while we work for you. Grant us favor, God. But it comes with a warning. When you seek God, when you act on this burden that he's given you and you prayed about it and you fasted and you're ready to move on action, be ready because the enemy's coming. The enemy will quickly oppose whatever God is trying to do. Be ready. We'll see a lot about that later. Nehemiah's boldness for the Lord is clear. He was willing to face the obstacles. He was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to go where God called him to do what he needed to do. His boldness was clear. How's yours? Are you bold for God? When we have a burden for the work of God, when we seek God faithfully, we receive favor from God. The old saying is, is if he leads you to it, he'll lead you through it. He doesn't just set you out there and say, you're on your own, figure it out. See you later, adios. If you're passionate about God's calling and you seek him faithfully, you will then be able to seek clear path on how to accomplish the task before you. With passion in your heart, will you be able to pass that vision onto others and build that passion in them? And that's how we advance the kingdom of God. We can't do it all ourselves. When you influence one, and then they put that passion in two, and then they put that passion in four more. When God starts building this mission, there ain't no stopping him, right? Amen? God will advance his purpose, and he'll do it with or without us. It's my prayer and desire to be part of that movement. So in pursuing a good work, we need to seek God faithfully. We need to define our vision clearly. We need to make our plans carefully. And then we need to inspire people passionately. You know, if you're here listening online, and you've never had that relationship with our Lord and Savior, a lot of this stuff makes no sense. 
why would I do those things? My prayer for you is that today, today would be the day that you would ask Jesus to come into your life, to be your Lord and Savior. It's a simple prayer. If you're here today and you've never asked the Lord into your life, get a hold of Daniel or myself or any other host team out here. We'd be more than happy to sit down and pray with you because the greatest gift you can receive this year is that salvation that God brought through His Son, Jesus Christ. And once you receive that salvation, once the Spirit starts indwelling in you, then these things start to make sense. And you start to get that passion and you start to move forward. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray that we would turn our eyes on Jesus. Lord, we understand that we're not to be naive, we're not to be head in the sand people. But Father, we're called to be your light. We're called to advance your kingdom. We're called to love. We're called to be compassionate. Brother, and I pray that, that this church would just continue to be your beacon throughout Pooler, throughout this whole area, Lord, that we would just allow your spirit to shine through us, Father, that, that we would feel this heavy, deep burden for what needs to be done, Lord, that we would turn to you, that we would come to you in prayer, that, that we would fast, Lord, that we would ask for your favor. Lord, it's my prayer that you would show us favor as we do your work and that we would be faithful and that we would come before you with believing, trusting hearts. Thank you for your words, Lord. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the people here. Lord, it's in Jesus' name that we pray.